Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says his country has always shown hospitality to refugees and hosts over 3 million Afghans. Speaking on India's controversial citizenship law at the first ever UN Global Refugee Forum in Geneva, he said world should take notice of what is happening in India. Earlier, UN Chief Antonio Guterres said more than ever international cooperation is needed to address the refugees' crisis. The forum is the first major meeting on refugees in the 21st century and is being jointly hosted by UNHCR and Switzerland. The other conveners of the forum are Turkey, Costa Rica, Ethiopia and Germany. Amnesty International India, which has slammed police violence on the students, protesting against the controversial citizenship law. In a statement, rights body said brutal action against the students of Jamia Millia University and Aligarh Muslim University must end. The rights body also said the Indian government must investigate allegations police sexually harassed female students. Hearing pleas seeking an investigation into police action against students, Indian Supreme Court asked petitioners to approach the high courts. Meanwhile, violent protests have continued against the controversial citizenship law. Demonstrations were held in Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad, Varanasi, Ahmedabad, Lucknow and Kolkata. Members of nearly 18 students' unions gathered outside Mumbai University to protest against the act. Police say over 3,000 protesters have been detained in the northeastern state of Assam. The protests left six people dead in Assam before spreading to other parts of the country. Moving on, the UN Security Council will meet today to discuss the worsening situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir. The council has been convened at China's request for the first time since a similar gathering in August. The meeting is being held after Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi wrote to the Security Council about potential escalation in tensions. In a note to the UNSC, China said the request is made due to seriousness of the situation in the region. It said Beijing will like to echo the request of Pakistan and seek a briefing of the Council on the situation of Kashmir. In August, India annexed the decades-old special status of Kashmir with an amendment in the constitution. The New Delhi's curfew and communications blackout in the valley has now entered 135th day. For more on this, we are joined by Mr. Salman Bashir, a former Foreign Secretary and High Commissioner of Pakistan in India. Thank you for your time. Now, Mr. Bashir, China has approached the UNSC once again to discuss the worsening situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Firstly, tell us what is the importance of today's session? Well, my understanding is that, uh, of course, the Kashmir issue has been on the agenda. There was, as you know, uh, a consultative meeting of the Council some time ago. Uh, the situation has not improved, actually worsened. I think uh, what is really uh, the purpose uh, for this meeting, uh, which we hope will take place, although I understand there are still consultations going on in this respect. But the key thing is the situation on the line of control, which uh, has been violated time and again by the Indians. Uh, in recent days, it has, uh, you know, uh, there's an added ominous dimension because the Indian uh, army uh, posture on the line of control is now alarming. It is offensive. And, uh, the Foreign Minister of Pakistan has written to the UN uh, Secretary General and the Security Council that uh, there is real apprehension that uh, the Indians may uh, be up to some sort of misadventure across the LOC. So what is being sought is a proper briefing by the UN military observers group of India and Pakistan uh, to the council. Uh, it is important uh, to, to sort of stem this thing before it erupts in a, in a manner that uh, becomes uncontainable. And I think that is what the consultations in New York are uh, about currently. Do you think today's session can help raise the pro-Kashmir argument at international level and pressurize India to resolve the outstanding issue? 
Well, that is certainly the hope of Pakistan. It is certainly the hope of the Kashmiris. It is the hope of every right-minded person who has had faith in the UN Charter and the UN system. But we know from the reality, the fact is that, of course, it adds... The profile has is already there. Again, the profile of the issue as far as the international community is concerned, it's very much there. But uh, the effectiveness, I mean, the other question is how effective can the council be? It can only at this point in time, I think, uh, exercise some sort of a moral influence uh, to restrain uh, Indians and to, uh, you know, the, the curfew, the, the lockdown in Kashmir is now that's 130 days, so it is just getting from back to work. Thank you, Mr. Salman Bashir, former Foreign Secretary and High Commissioner of Pakistan in India, for joining us. More in this bulletin, U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham says Pakistan can accelerate the peace process in Afghanistan. Speaking in Kabul, Graham said Pakistan can apply more pressure on Taliban to facilitate a resolution to the Afghan conflict. He said the relationship between U.S. President Trump and Pakistan's civil military leadership could be key in this regard. I think the relationship that President Trump has with Pakistan uh, could change behavior in a way that would really accelerate the chance for peace. We all know that if Pakistan applied more pressure on the Taliban, it would be enormously helpful to resolving the conflict here. In Afghanistan, 10 people have been killed in an IED blast in Afghanistan's eastern host province. The Interior Ministry says members of the same family were traveling when their car hit a roadside bomb. The ministry said three children and two women are among the dead in Ashir district. Officials said the victims had been driving a large station wagon type vehicle. The ministry blamed the Taliban for the attack. No one has yet claimed responsibility. Russia and China have proposed to ease UN sanctions against North Korea. In a draft resolution, both countries suggested to relax curbs if Pyongyang commits to Security Council resolutions on denuclearization. The two countries argue that a relaxation of some sanctions will encourage the North to resume denuclearization talks. Meanwhile, the US has dismissed the proposal, calling it a premature relief. Officials said the UN should reject the proposal as Pyongyang is threatening to conduct an escalated provocation and refusing to meet the talks. Earlier, President Donald Trump said he will be disappointed if something was in the works in North Korea. He said the US was watching activities in the country closely. The United Nations says it has no choice but to keep shipping humanitarian aid across Syria's borders and civil war front lines. In a statement, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the bloc did not have an alternative means of reaching people in need. A report submitted to the UN Security Council said over 6 million people received food and medical treatment in the country. Security Council members have proposed a one-year renewal of the aid operation as its mandate expires on January 10th. But Russia wants a six-month renewal that ignores Guterres' assertion regarding cross-border assistance. Moscow has also proposed to close two of the current four entry points into Syria used for aid. Israel's embattled Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing a challenge from Gideon Saar for the leadership of Likud Party. The veteran politician's leadership bid marks the first serious inter Nil challenge to Netanyahu. While launching his bid for party's leadership, Saar said the writing was on the wall for Netanyahu. Saar is gaining tr traction in the run-up to December 26th internal party election. Israel's longest-serving leader, Netanyahu, faces a corruption indictment, while he has also been unable to form a government twice this year. Venezuela's Constituent Assembly has approved a trial for four opposition lawmakers on treason and conspiracy charges. Chief State Prosecutor Tarek Saab accused the politicians of conspiring to seize military installations. The pro-government Constituent Assembly voted unanimously to revoke the lawmakers' immunity at trial after request by Venezuela's top court. Constituent Assembly President 
Deus dado cabelo said justice will be served. The magistrate hereby requests the continuation of the trial to these gentlemen in the ordinary court, and I want to put it to a vote. There has to be justice here one day. Three people have died as tornadoes have wreaked havoc across the southeastern United States. A couple was killed in northern Alabama, while an elderly woman lost her life in Louisiana. Officials say the storms tore roofs off buildings, splintered trees and pulled down power lines. They say the most damage was reported in Alabama, Louisiana and Texas. A power outage tracking website said almost 30,000 people suffered electricity failures. More rain and wind are expected today as the storms push off into southeastern Georgia, Florida and both Carolinas. We have a lot more coming up, so stay tuned after this short break. Welcome back. 14 people have been killed in a coal mine blast in southwest China. Government officials say two miners are still trapped underground after the explosion at the mine in Gaozhou province. Officials say seven workers were lifted to safety after the accident and rescue work is continuing. The accident is the latest in a series of mining incidents in China. Earlier on Saturday, flooding in a mine in Sichuan province killed five and trapped 13 miners underground. An Australian court has sentenced two brothers to a total of 76 years in prison for planning to blow up an Etihad Airways flight. The two men were convicted for planning a terrorist attack on a flight from Sydney to Abu Dhabi in July 2017. The New South Wales Supreme Court sentenced Khalid Khayat to 40 years in prison with no parole until 2047. His brother Mahmoud Khayat was sentenced to 36 years with no possibility of parole until 2044. Khalid and Mahmoud Khayat were arrested during police raids in Sydney. The police say high-grade explosives used to make the bomb were flown from Turkey as part of a plot by ISIS. Police have rescued a 12-year-old boy who fled a raging bushfire in Western Australia by driving his brother's pickup truck to safety with their dog. This report will tell you more. Lucas Storok was alone at home when his father and brother were fighting a bush fire at Mogumber. When the fire, which has burnt over 7,500 hectares, approached the house, Lucas grabbed his dog and drove to a pre-arranged meeting spot. Fortunately, local fire crews managed to find the boy. It was pretty scary environment, like lots of smoke, visibility was very low, you could see the flames, they were quite high. So it was an active fire ground. His father said he was relieved and emotional when police returned Lucas to their home. Very emotional, yes. Yeah. It was just one relief, a big relief. There was a few tears, yeah, for sure. Across parts of the eastern state of New South Wales, temperatures are expected to top 40 degrees Celsius tomorrow. Firefighters say they will not be able to contain the fires, while conditions are expected to deteriorate this week. In Pakistan, a special court has sentenced former President Pervez Musharraf to death on charges of high treason and subverting the constitution. The court found him guilty of imposing emergency in country in November 2007. A three-member bench announced the verdict after hearing final arguments today. General Musharraf seized power in a military coup in 1999. He is currently in Dubai after being allowed to leave the country for medical treatment in 2016. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket has launched a massive satellite into orbit from Florida to provide communications in the Asia-Pacific region. The rocket carried the satellite into the air above Cape Canaveral. After a successful launch, the Falcon 9 booster came back to Earth, landing on a drone ship in the Atlantic. 
The satellite reached geostationary transfer orbit minutes later. Recovery boats were deployed off the coast to catch the two halves of the fairing, but narrowly missed them. The company said a team is working to recover them for potential use on a future flight. Main engine cut off. Stage separation. Screen. Miko. Stage separation. Stage. In Peru, Edgar and Dominique are the latest conjoined twins to be surgically separated. The twins have arrived at home after recovering at a hospital in San Borja district of Lima. A Peruvian mother of conjoined twins is celebrating a Christmas miracle this year. Her babies came home for the first time after going through a successful 18-hour operation. Cases like theirs are extremely rare occurring once every 200,000 births. This is the first case in the country with Siamese twins that were born joined by this part that are Chiapogas twins, which was achieved through the work of the entire team. It's a success and also a miracle. The surgery involved more than 40 medical specialists, including pediatric surgeons, radiologists. It's a Christmas miracle. I spent last Christmas hospitalized from the caesarean and them as well. We did not spend it together and this Christmas I am going to spend it with my family and with them. And it's their first year. That was my Christmas gift. I wanted them to be here with me separated. Research shows 40 to 60 percent of conjoined twins arrive stillborn and about 35 percent live only one day. The mortality rates for twins who do live and then undergo separation vary depending on the type of connection and the organs they share. Japan says it will continue a dialogue to resolve trade issues with South Korea. Senior Japanese and South Korean trade officials met for the first time since Tokyo imposed control on Seoul's exports in July. Japan's Trade Minister Hiroshi Kajiyama said a better understanding of bilateral management of export control systems has been reached. He said the next round of trade talks between the two countries will be held in Seoul in the near future. We were also able to discuss about updating and improving each country's export control system. In order to resolve our issues, we hope to continue our dialogue and communication on export controls. We are planning to hold the next meeting for trade talks in Seoul in the near future. Stock markets across Europe are trading lower following a worldwide rally on the back of a phase one trade deal between the US and China. Investors are trading carefully over Britain's trade deal with EU ahead of Brexit deadline. Frankfurt stacks and CAC 40 in Paris is trading fractionally lower. London's FTSE 100 is trading marginally lower as Unilever shares dropped more than 5.5%. British banks RBS, Lloyds and Barclays each shared over 2.5%. In Asia, trade deal optimism, positive economic signals in China sent shares to an 18-month high. Shanghai Composite led the gains to close over 1% higher. Hong Kong's Hang Seng gained over 1% as shares of digital app Meitu rocketed over 8%. Seoul's Kospi also traded over 1% higher amid shares of Samsung Electronics surged over 3%. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.